And then the band I was writing for was Toys in the Attic, which I had on the side. And that was a little more me. It was a little more kind of, kind of power pop, punky sort of rock, that kind of thing, right. you know? It was always, it was always like a cheap, tricky kind of a vibe with, you know, that kind of thing. We're, um, we're about to touch on the Candy Harlots. So f- from memory, the Candy Harlots placed an ad in on the street looking for a bass player. Oh, what, what was it? You saw that, you saw that ad and applied. Was it as simple as that? I've, I've got a beauty for you on this one that I don't think I've ever okay. told anyone. I, um, I happened under the Candy Harlots one night at um, the Caring Bar Inn. Supporting went, Boss. I went to see Boss play. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we were friends with Kevin and, and those guys. So we went to see Boss play and there was an opening band called Whip and the middle band was the Candy Harlots. I'd never heard of them before. It was 87. When that came on, everybody in the room, I remember, all my friends were looking at them and they were saying, man, these guys look awesome. It looks so cool. When I started yeah. playing, everybody changed their attitude. Everyone's going, oh my God, they're awful. The singing, I can't sing, blah, blah, blah. I was, I was like, this is great. This is like kind of like the studio just meets Motorhead or something. You know, the way they're yeah. singing. I'd never heard it. And yet they look like the New York Dolls. This is great. No one's done this. You know, this is awesome. Everyone's going, you've got rocks in your head. Okay, whatever. They played, they finished. Then I saw them again a few months later at St. James Cabin. And again, the people were going, these guys are awful. They were playing the King's Cross. These guys are awful. And I said, no, nah, look, you know, they're really cool. And they go, no, they're awful. I go, they sound like Gary Glitter tonight. You know, the other night they sounded like Stooges. Tonight they sound like Gary Glitter. And I liked them. And then I, I remember seeing an ad and it said, uh, Candy House require a bass player, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, you know what, I should go for this. I should go for this. And... Just as I was looking at it and thinking I should go for this, I pick up another copy of On the Street and it's got them playing support for Cheap Trick at the Tivoli. Yeah. And I had tickets to that and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I've already got a bass player. <laughs> How did this happen? I went to see them with the Cheap Trick. Sure enough, they had a different bass player. Um, Scott, they had a guy called Scott. And I thought, geez, does that happen quick? You know, oh, well, that's, that's done. That's fine. About a a week later, there's <laughs> another ad in on the street. I still need a bass player. And I thought, okay, this time I'm going for it. So I sent them off a little package and everything. And I got the call back. And I think I was like one of the one of the last. They were auditioning people for two weeks. And I went in and, and auditioned and, and uh, got called back for the second one. And that was it. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. And uh, I don't know if you know, but first time I actually saw the, the, the band were supporting Cheap Trick at the Tivoli. Yeah. And that's April of 88. Not yeah, you know, I thought they were amazing. Personally, <laughs> the, the couple of bass players they had in the lineup at that time were good, but not quite right. First show right. I saw you with the band DY Hotel, some months later. All the pieces of the puzzle fit. You suited the band so well. And once you, once I heard your bass on um, the specimen, specimens, kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Oh, I thought you. they found they found the right guy. Oh, thanks, man. No, I'd, I'd found my home You're finally welcome. after after kind of. Quite, it, it's funny. It's before the harlots. It was almost like I was looking to put something like that together that I could just never get it, never find the people, right. never, never quite knew that I was looking for that exact thing. But I found it and I thought, okay, now I'm home. Exactly the same thing happened when I ended up in Jerk. I was, I, I knew exactly what I wanted the band to be. I know what I wanted it to sound like. I just couldn't find the people and they found me. So, you know, it's really nice when that happens. Definitely, definitely. So, and, and for you, I guess it's happened, you know, two or three times in your career. Yeah, it's just, just, you know, it's a little bit luck and it's a little, little bit kind of being around and people know what you well, do. Well, perseverance as well, hard work. So thinking back to that thing. time period, and we'll take a break in a moment, I'm going to play a song, but they were heady days for the Candy Harlots. There was a huge buzz around the band. You were dubbed Sydney's biggest live secret. You know, the, the debut seven-inch Red Hot Rocket sold out in a couple of hours. Yeah. Did it feel like you were riding a wave towards something bigger with that lineup of the band? It, it did. Um, with the Mark Eastman lineup, yeah, it did. It, it felt like something had to give, you know. But unfortunately, we started getting played a little bit by, you know, the people that, that, that kind of really want things. Yeah, you know, management, I don't want to put blame on anyone because everybody wanted a common sort of thing to happen. Everybody wanted us to work. You know, we'd sign a publishing deal and then, then the publishers would say, OK, you've got to tone down this. You've got to kind of try and, we'd try and you know, get the ears of people and... Maybe you should turn this down. Maybe you should turn that down. Maybe you should drop this song because it's got the word slut in it. Maybe think about changing the name because Harlot isn't a word people like saying in America. And it's like, well, like, well, you know, oh, there was one guy. There was one guy that wanted to sign us to his label, and he was uh, distributed by Polygram, so it would have been worthwhile. 
Mm-hmm. He had us in. He had us in for a meeting. He had a live tape of the band playing. I don't know where he'd gotten it, but he was playing this live tape of the band, a desk tape, and he was telling us how great everything was. Then he told us he he wanted us to uh, make the look a little more street and go into a studio and demo a whole bunch of new songs and maybe think about recording some covers and and all this kind of stuff. And we just ended up turning around and saying, look, we're not the band for you, you know? Sure. And it pissed our manager off because he thought finally they're going to get a deal, but we just really didn't. Ron wouldn't have stood for that. Mark wouldn't have stood for that. I didn't agree. Mm. I thought, you know what? What we've got is what we are. Let's just persevere with this. It ended up getting the better of Mark. A couple of things, you know, contributed to him leaving some personal stuff, but also the fact that he was just really sick of, of being told, be this, be that. And sure. really, we all were. And, uh, Unfortunately, you know, it got the breaking point. And then Ron, Ron passing away didn't help because he was really a really, really big part of the heart and soul of that band. You know, and once he was sure. gone, it was just whatever that original lineup stood for, it just wasn't there anymore. Well, from a fan's perspective, um, that that tag, Biggest Live Secret, is, is accurate because I think 88, 89, that year of the band is where my fondest memories are. And oh, apart from, you. I think I think apart from a few others, we felt like we discovered this you know, what every fan dreams of, this cool rock and roll band on the verge of exploding, which the mainstream public had yet to hear about. It was such a cool thing, but but importantly, the band was just as good, if not better, than anything from overseas. And you just shared some memories there, but personally, I mean, from Blacktown in the West, inner city, Coogee, the northern beaches, that car of mine clocked up some serious I know, miles. You guys, you guys came to Geelong, <laughs> didn't you? Mate, yeah, we haven't. We made it to Geelong and Richmond, yeah. and Victoria. Do, do you recall that first Melbourne joint? A- absolutely, absolutely. I think right. I have a photo of, of. I might have a photo of you guys standing outside a blackboard at the Bowen Club, perhaps, or a live right, tape that you right. made, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I well, that, that. The, the Richmond show. The Richmond shows is especially memorable for me that because, was great. um, yeah. well, that's when I first saw a band called Girl Monster, an act who ah. opened for you, which in turn led to friendships sure. with Anne and Sherry, who I'm still good friends with to this day. Oh, uh, you know what? Remind me to them because I haven't had any contact with those people in a long time, and they were really nice people. Okay. Yeah. Will do. Will do. Good people. But um, the the debut single, Red Hot Rocket, was produced by one of. Uh, our heroes, my heroes, Mick Cox. What yeah. are your memories of recording that tune with Coxie? Well, okay, Red Hot Rocket. Okay, the absolute, yeah. the, the truth of that matter is I wasn't in the band at that point. Okay. That's Mick and Goody playing bass on that song. They had okay. the single recorded and they went in and did it with Mick because they couldn't find the guy they wanted to use, like a new bass player yet, so they just went in and recorded it. Okay. And when will I know as well? So I came in for the release of that. So unfortunately, I, I wish I could. I wish I could say I had memories of Mick Cox from that, but unfortunately, no. I mentioned a moment ago your ability to write songs with cool melodies, and and the Candy Harlot's second single, Danger, is further evidence of that. Did you did you have that tune up your sleeve, or did you write it around that I, time period? I wrote that song in in 1987, and when I, I really it was Mark Easton. Everybody had this idea of Mark as being you know the the arrogant front man and the star of the show and all this kind of stuff. In the end, the only reason I brought songs in was because Mark was saying to me, have you got anything? I'd like to hear it. And I brought in a song and we kind of toyed with it for a while. It didn't work. And then he said, have you got anything else? And I said, well, I've got this. And I I pulled out Danger and he just fell in love with it. And the rest of the band loved it. And they just did a great job of it. And it it ended up being the single. And then the reason I, the the, the only reason I ever ended up doing She Shines on stage was because Mark insisted that I take center stage and sing that song. It was Mark. It was it was a good call. That was Mark's idea. I brought it in for him. He tried singing it at rehearsal, and he said, "You know what? You sell it better. You should do this." And I was like, "Are you crazy? I've never <laughs> sang in my life." And like, you're the guy, you know, like you're you are the stand. And he's like, "No, man." He had it all down. He was like, "No, man. I'm going to put the mic stand. You're going to use my mic stand. I'm going to put it in the center." No, that's that's I'm interesting. Use, so that's yeah. that's the first that's the first time period where you thought. You know, you have a strong you have strong vocals, or you didn't think that before. I, I sing I could sing well enough to demo, and, I, and I actually, I've just found there's a I can't I don't, I don't know how it ended up there, but I just tonight when I was doing a bit of, bit of searching around the rock back site and stuff, and I found that there's the very first song that I ever recorded in my life that, that I sang on a song called Heart to Heart is up on YouTube, and I have no idea how it got there or who mm. put it there because I don't even know if I have a copy of it. 
So I'd well, done a song, but it was pretty much just for demoing purposes. The um, the version of uh, of Danger, which found its way onto the Five Wicked Ways album, is slicker and 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 heavier. But as I have a fondness for the Mark Easton lineup, if I can use yeah. that reference, that's the track I'm going to play today. But before sure. we do, can we drift back to the year 1990 and we're, we're, we're well into this? A year filled with highs and lows for the band. Um, more touring. Still, you have, I guess, you got major labels, couple sniffing around. I guess maybe you release another record. Yeah, we did. And, and and as many of us remember, um, guitarist Ron Barrett uh, tragically mm. passes away in late 1990. Personally, I chatted with him many times whilst following the band, and he was always decent and a, a good guy who lived and breathed for his yeah. music. Um, do you have one Ron story you'd like to share before we play Danger? Oh, look, when I first joined, um, when I first tried out for the band, Ron wasn't present. He was in the States. Um, when he got back, he was at the second jam, and he just he just said, why are we even ask? Why are we even questioning it? He's the right guy. He just basically voted me in straight away. He just said, "This is the mm. right guy." And in the beginning, though, I wasn't too sure about Ron. The other guys kind of. I got on really well with Hugo. I got on really well with Cardinal. Easton was a little standoffish at the beginning. I think that was him being mm. the singer. And the guys warned me about that. They said, "You know, look, Mark's likely to be a little cool because he wants to assert his position." But after a little while, we became really close. Ron took me a longer time to warm up to because he was really brash, really arrogant, really kind of, you know, spoke his mind and didn't give a shit who heard or, you know. And I thought, okay, I've got to be, I've got to tiptoe a little around this guy. In the space of about two years, the most amazing thing happened. Ron just kind of changed. He just really matured and grew up. And he and I began sharing rooms together on the road because we just got on, we ended up getting on so well. I can remember sitting on, one of my last memories was sitting on the balcony high up above um, the, the Gold Coast when we were playing Queensland and me and I was sitting on the balcony having a beer and having a chat and just talking about how excited we were about how good the band was going to be because we just got Phil in who was really excited. He said, look, I feel like we've got a hold on this again now and I feel like we're going to be able to do something. He was really positive and he was great. We were getting on fantastically. Um, he was writing great. He was playing great. We were starting to talk about writing stuff together. It could have been great. Um, yeah. And then my last memory of him was a few months after that, our first absolute sellout of the General Burke Hotel, where the full house sign went up like about an hour and a half before we played. And the Baby Animals opened for us. It was one of their first shows, one of their earliest shows. Okay. Oh, brilliant. And um, at the end of the night, spirits were really high. You know, like one last thing Ron said to me was, See you Monday, Leans, because we we're going to catch mm. up. And I said, yeah, man, see you Monday. You know, and that was it. And that was the last time I saw him, which is a bummer. That's 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 nice. Look, um, 26 years old is way too young to exit. And I oh, hope God, that this yeah. interview and in, and indeed other articles I've written about the Candy Harlots ensure that his memory lives on. And with that thought in mind, here is the Candy Harlots featuring Ron Barrett on guitar on the Lean OD written Danger. <laughs> 